created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now we'll turn as well uh, to a second reading from uh, Genesis 9. Verse 1 to 7. This after the flood, and the uh, end of the flood. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon every thing that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth, and multiply in it. So far, our reading of scripture. Let's come before God in prayer and ask for his blessing on our time together. O Lord, our almighty God in heaven, we call on you as mighty God, as the eternal Lord, and as our loving Father. And O Lord, we call on you as the one who created all things heaven and earth and everything that fills them. Lord, you displayed such incredible power and dominion and perfect wisdom in calling forth everything into being simply by speaking, and it was so. And, O Lord, you not only made the world that we see and so much that we do not see, but, Father, you have made us. You made man and woman in your image, in your likeness. Lord, you breathed the breath of life into us, and you gave us a special position in your creation as sons and daughters, as those given dominion, and Father, also as those brought into covenant with you. Lord, you showed such a rich mercy in coming near, in deciding to fellowship with human beings. Father, even when we turned our back on you, when we rebelled and rejected you, Father, you showed such an amazing grace. You did not abandon the work of your hands. And so, Father, the world that you made, which was very good, which fell into sin, you are restoring. And you are making it good again. You've made us good again, even righteous and perfect in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you for the great works of your hands. We thank you that we may know you from the very first pages of scripture to the very end, to know you as the eternal and the wonder-working God and the God who is full of love and mercy 
for the world and the people that you have made. Father, we thank you that we can be together to learn about your creative acts and your work of creating man in your own image and what that means for today, also in the world that we live in. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word together and to have a teacher in our midst who can teach us. Father, we pray for a blessing on our learning and on the opening of your word. We ask that you would give to Dr. Van Vliet the wisdom and the words that he needs and give to us as well, attentive hearts and minds. Lord, bless us in all that we do and keep us from sin and evil so that through this too, your name may be praised. O oh Lord, we ask these things in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son. Amen. I'd like to begin with singing as well. Uh, Psalm 8, verse 1, 3, and 4. Uh, we don't have a uh, accompanist, uh, so I'll rely on somebody to start us off uh, at the right place. Uh, Psalm 8, verse 1, 3, and 4. I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. I wrote down an introduction because uh, over the course of uh, Dr. Van Vliet's visit here, he's been uh, misrepresented, uh, or his family has been in different ways. Uh, he's gone from having six, seven children to six and uh, served different churches that you never were at. So I wrote it down. Um, Dr. Van Vliet is uh, in our midst. He's a professor of dogmatics at the CRTS in Hamilton, where he has served for the last 10 years. Uh, prior to being appointed to serve the seminary, he served uh, in two churches in Canada, uh, first in the east, Lincoln, and then in the west, Surrey. Uh, he and his wife, Janet, have been blessed with seven children. Uh, Dr. Van Vliet and his wife have been in Australia for about two weeks now, uh, which is a, a short period of time, but long enough to learn already about the joys of Tim Tams and four-wheel driving on the beach in Albany. Uh, they've experienced cold winter nights, uh, but also warm hospitality. Uh, so we 
We're glad that Dr. Van Vliet can be in our midst. Uh, he will now present to us on the image of God. After his presentation, we'll have an uh, opportunity for questions and answers, and then he'll talk after that about the work of the seminary. Welcome, brother. Father, thank you very much for your absolutely accurate introduction. Every detail was correct, so thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you also to all of you, also through the deputies, but for your invitation to come here to this beautiful part of God's creation, but uh, even more than enjoying certain areas and aspects of this part of the world, we have been simply uh, touched by and in many ways overwhelmed by what the Lord, the Holy Spirit works in our midst. We can come here to really the other side of the globe, as you well know, and uh, almost instantly feel at home in the brothers and sisters, the fellowship of the congregations here. And if you've experienced this in your own life, you know that it is a very powerful thing. So thank you for your invitation, thank you for the time, and thank you also for this opportunity to speak to you this evening. So the topic this evening is the image of God with a particular emphasis on how it can be an antidote for abortion and euthanasia. On the right-hand side of the screen, the words image of God speak of something very beautiful, very profound, a deep privilege, and also a very significant responsibility. The left-hand side of the screen right now, you see two words that are sinful, abortion, euthanasia. Not only sinful, gravely sinful, and in many respects, horribly and tragically sinful. And the question that we want to explore this evening is how what's on the right-hand side, which is how God created things to be, can also help us in dealing with the tragedy, the brokenness, and the sadness that is in our world concerning abortion and euthanasia. So let's first turn to some laws and some statistics applying here in Australia. Now, I readily admit that I'm no expert on the laws or the statistics of Australia, and if, if I have misrepresented things in any way, then perhaps you can correct me or shed further light on it. But in doing a little bit of research, I learned that, in the first place, laws pertaining to abortion here in Australia are state by state, and therefore things may differ from area to area. There's an added challenge in that to find out exactly how many abortions are happening, how many times this tragedy and indeed the sin of murder is being committed, it's actually not very easy at all because there's only one state in Australia that's keeping track of statistics and that's Southern Australia or South Australia and all the rest have to be kind of extrapolated using math from there. Nevertheless, even with those variables that we maybe can't be too accurate about, you see, admittedly a little bit older, about 10 years ago, the graph or the, the map which shows the various statistics, and it shows that um, in some areas it's thought that uh, 20 to even 30 percent of all children conceived are being put to death, and that's why I could find on the right-hand side a little graphic there which says that up to one in three Australian women will have an abortion at some point in her life. Even if you've heard statistics like this before, brothers and sisters, every time you see it again, you just cannot help but be deeply grieved. One in three women have this happening, have made this choice or felt forced to do this. If we go to the next topic of 
doctor-assisted suicide, what's also called here, I learned um, within the legal realm, voluntary assisted dying, sometimes abbreviated VAD. The situation may not seem quite as dire, at least not yet. There was one of the states here in Australia, the Northern Territory, which briefly allowed doctor-assisted dying or voluntary-assisted dying, but then that was repealed. And if I understand things well, though, the Parliament of Victoria has passed a law allowing this, and it's actually coming into effect this year, in fact, in, in the summer. Uh, so right now, well, winter. But I would think of it as summer, but you think of it as call it winter. In these months, the middle of the year, it's starting to be put into practical effect. The situation is certainly no better in Canada, either with respect to abortion or doctor-assisted dying. In some respects, particularly with the latter, it is even worse. All this leads to a question which has been asked by a certain author, Wesley J. Smith, are we entering a culture of death? It would seem that culture should be dominated by questions of life and promoting life and productivity and enjoyment of life. But there seems to be a, a growing focus in our society on death, both the earliest stages, abortion, and at the last stages concerning doctor-assisted suicide. And what is perhaps addedly shocking in both is that doctors either promote this or are asked to work this out in their daily practice. The Hippocratic Oath has been part of the culture of medicine for a very, very long time. And one of the primary things of the Hippocratic Oath is that above all else, do not harm. Whatever else you do as a doctor, but make sure you don't harm those who are entrusted to your care. And now it would seem that the doctors are being asked, and sometimes quite willingly want to, harm even to the point of death. And the, the matter that Wesley J. Smith is putting before his audience is, how did it come here? How did it get so completely turned around? And what ought to be done? Well, he puts the question, and this evening, what I want to do with you is explore a, a biblical answer to these questions. So this is the issue. How are we, as Reformed Christians, basing our life on the Bible, the Word of God, how are we going to speak to our society? How are we going to work within our society where both abortion and doctor-assisted dying are on the rise and becoming more commonplace? There are various approaches that could be taken and have been taken. The first approach is how society around us, generally speaking, looks at these issues. They look at it from a quality of life approach, which basically means this, a high quality of life in the estimation of many is when the things that you see on the right hand side are a significant part of life, that you have happiness, that you have mobility, and you can use your choice and your intellect to make various options available to you and to shape up your life in a way that will ultimately make you happy. Then you have a high quality of life, then life is worth living. But there are other things that seem to lower the quality of life. If your mobility is restricted, if you have to deal with a lot of pain, if you have very serious and grave diseases that you have to deal with. And then it becomes a rather subjective evaluation, as you can well understand. How much of the what so-called quality of life has to be replaced by a lower quality of life before 
someone could be considered to be put to death, either at the very beginning or the end. Who's going to decide? On what basis are they going to decide? And many of these things are based on the perceptions. The perceptions of people that they're losing choice or that person has lost intellect. And overall, this whole quality of life approach, you know, leave aside the fact that it's not based on the word of God. The other part and the other problem with it all is that it becomes more and more relative and subjective the longer you think about it. Now, in response to this, what the church has often reached to, and this is somewhat characteristic of pro-life movements, is what's called the sanctity of life approach. And some of them, maybe the colors don't come through uh, quite as clearly as I had hoped, so I'll hopefully make it clear uh, what it says. But the top one says, God created human beings. Therefore, life is a gift from God. And since life is a gift from God, there's just something very special about it. And because there's something special, there's something set apart about life, which you could also say is holy, it therefore should be respected. This is a dominant approach within the Roman Catholic Church. I'll give you one quote here, and this is from a Roman Catholic source. The Catholic Church proclaims that human life is sacred, it's holy, and that the dignity of the human person is the foundation for the moral vision of society. This belief is the foundation of all the principles of our social teaching. So this is how the Roman Catholic Church has approached all of this. And as you know, the Roman Catholic Church is quite strong on pro-life issues overall. They say, if you want to go down and find the principle on which we can say abortion is wrong, euthanasia or doctor-assisted dying is wrong, it's life is sacred, life is holy. Now, while showing respect for that, what's striking, brothers and sisters, is that when we open the Word of God and we look to a very central passage concerning a prohibition of murder, also within this fallen world, the words that are used by the Holy Spirit are not in the first place holiness or sacredness of life, but something different. We read it together, Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. That's how serious it is. But what's the reason? God made man in his own image. It really is the doctrine of the image of God which is the foundation upon which the defense against abortion and euthanasia should be built. But what does that mean? How can we work that out and explain it. I would like to just observe right from the beginning that a prohibition of murder based on the image of God includes at least two main things. First of all, what man is, he has an image and he has an image of God that he bears. So that defines him, he's an image bearer of God. But you see in those words, his own, that there's a certain emphasis on relationship. It's not just that man is in our image, but it's that he's in God's image and God's own image. And it's that emphasis on the relationship between God and this creature, man, male and female. It's not just a special kind of life, it's a special kind of relationship that God created us with. And we want to see that this is actually a stronger way to speak abor against abortion and euthanasia than even the sanctity of life argument. Okay, that leads us to go to the next key matter then. We're going to need to understand exactly what the image of God is and how it ultimately applies in these ethical issues. 
Let's begin by going way, way back to the early church, to one of the church fathers, Justin Martyr, going back to the second century AD, and here's a quote from him. In the beginning, God made the human race with the power of thought and of choosing the truth and doing right. It is for this reason that not only for Justin Martyr and for many in the early church, but even through the Middle Ages, one of the central ways in which church leaders and theologians defined what is the image of God, they said it's the capacity of human beings to think and make choices. Intellect, volition. Now, I just want to highlight from the beginning that there is something problematic here. Because if you think about it, let's take a six-month-old child. It's a human being created in the image of God. Let's also take a well-trained, somewhat older German shepherd. Now, in certain respects, the thinking of that dog, that well-chained German shepherd, and the choices that he may make also to avoid danger may be higher, may be stronger than what naturally resides in a six-month-old child. The German shepherd may make a better choice to protect the child than the child him or herself would. Does that mean that somehow the German shepherd has more of the image of God than the child? Intuitively, scripturally, we say no. But then maybe we need to understand the image of God in a slightly different way. Let's go from a very old definition to a much newer definition that I read. It was introduced in a Christian curriculum. Now I should clarify, this was not from our own schools, either in Canada or schools down here, just in a Christian curriculum that I found somewhere. This is how the image of God was defined. We also believe that all people in the world, regardless of race and gender and religion and economic status or location, all of them are made in God's image. Well, what is that? Define what it means to be made in the God's image was kind of a quote in there. That is, we create, we care, we love, we forgive. So you see those kinds of things going on in human beings. They're creative, they're caring, they're loving, and they're forgiving. And there you see, said this definition in this curriculum, there you see the image of God. If you put that very old and this new definition together, then what we would be left with is the idea that the image of God is an ability, it's a capacity to think, to choose, to care, to create, and to communicate. And you could add a few more circles there, but it gives you a good idea. Really, then, if you want to answer the question, what is the image of God, many would say human beings are able to, and then they fill in all kinds of things, but that's the key phrase. Human beings are able to do these things. How does that really work out? It seemed that there are a number of significant problems with that kind of a definition. Number one, what if you have someone who's not very creative at all? Someone, for instance, like me, whose artistic abilities top out at Stickman and go no higher. What does that mean compared to, I'm sure, someone here who can draw and paint and do all kinds of wonderful creative things? Does that person have more image of God than a crude Stickman artist like me? Is that what it means? Or we all know that people can be caring, even unbelievers can be caring at some times, 
But we also know that people can be very uncaring and un- can be very cruel. Sometimes within the church, sometimes also, of course, within society. But as people are more caring and less caring, does that mean that their image of God goes up and down and maybe they go into the image of God and then out of it and back into it when they're caring again? What about people who can't communicate? In our first congregation, we had the equivalent of what you would call here the eucalypt home. It was beautiful having these brothers and sisters in the congregation. Some of them really could not verbally communicate. Some of them, even in nonverbals, could hardly, if at all, communicate. Are they missing some big part? Do they only have some partial image or lack of image of God then? And if they do, could they be put to death because the image of God isn't there, which we know from Genesis 9 is the prohibition foundation? Or what if people could at one time think and communicate and be creative, but because of coma, because of some other circumstance, they can't do any of that anymore. If that's what image of God is, then the argument might be made If the image has disappeared, then why not feel free to put them to death? So the basic point here is that with that kind of a definition of the image of God, we would stand on rather fragile foundations so far as a prohibition for murder. For this reason, then, we need to look more closely at what the Bible says and allow God to explain to us What now really is the image of God? We read together from Genesis chapter 1. It's clear there that the image of God also includes a very definite likeness between God and us. Let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. God is God and always will remain. Human beings are human beings. They always will remain. But God created it so that there must be some kind of parallel likeness between the two. So just hold on to that thought for a moment. We also know from Genesis chapter 9, and we'll elaborate on that in just a moment, that that image is still in some respect there because it's the foundation for the prohibition against murder. But what often happens, brothers and sisters, is that people skip over a very important revelation between Genesis 1 and Genesis 29. Speak about the image of God, people go there, Genesis 1, or they go to Genesis 9. But what they miss is Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and blessed them and named them man when they were created. This, in short, is like a summary. It's an echo of what the Lord said in Genesis 1 as we read it. But then notice it doesn't stop there. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and he named him Seth. Here the Holy Spirit takes these key words in Genesis, image and likeness, and right after speaking about the creation of human beings, both male and female, he applies it in the very next verse to the relationship between Adam and his son Seth. Image and likeness speak within the context of relationship, and we can specify that now more clearly, father-children relationship. This is further confirmed in the New Testament where we read in Luke chapter 3, verse 38. In that chapter, there's a genealogy starting with the Lord Jesus Christ and then going back through all the generations. And you would expect that at the end of that genealogy, you must come to Adam. 
I mean, how much further can you go back than the first father, Adam? And now look at this. Seth was the son of Adam. The genealogy, there's no period there. This genealogy does not stop there. It continues Adam, the son of God. Of course we understand that God is in a completely different category than every other name mentioned in that genealogy. And yet there it is. It emphasizes father-child relationship. This then becomes part of the biblical definition. To be created in the image of God means to be created to be the children of God. And the likeness is like father, like children. When we have that in our mind, then we go forward to the next step because we have to immediately say that as beautiful and as privileged as that is, we're no longer there. We're living after the fall into sin. So this one here says, uniquely excellent man at creation. That's how we were, were, how we were created to be. But now we're here in the utterly sinful man after the fall. By the grace of God, some are brought into the restoration, graciously restored man in Christ, and will one day be gloriously restored at the consummation. So the image of God has to be understood clearly as this is the way it was at creation. Now all human beings are here in the fall. Some have been taken into the restoration, and those who have been restored by Christ will one day be fully restored when he returns on the clouds of heaven. Two errors could be made. On the one hand, we could focus our attention on the image of God as at creation and forget about the utter travesty of the fall. But there's another mistake that we could make and is to focus on the fact that all human beings are utterly depraved and forget that they were created in the image of God. Either one would be a serious error. I just want to touch on our confessions for a moment. Lord's Day 4, God created man good and in his image, that is, in true righteousness and holiness. There is part of the likeness, key central elements of the likeness. But we also have it coming back in Lord's Day 32, because Christ who is the Son, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by the Holy Spirit to be his image. Note this, his image, referring to Christ, who is the Son. We are restored to be children of God as we were created to be children of God. We saw the biblical basis there as well. If we need more detail on that, we can talk about that in the question period. I'd like to bring this together in a diagram that is a summary of Calvin's work on this topic. Here you see, and again I'll have to explain it a little bit, but Calvin came to put it together in this way. God, who is Father, created Adam and Eve, who were created as a son and a daughter of God the Father as we would expect, even in human relations. When you see parents, you look over at their children and you say, ah, I see some connection here. You must be from such and such a family. Normally we're just doing that on the outward physical features. But of course for God, it's the inward that counts above all else. And therefore God who is full of wisdom, justice, goodness, mercy, truth, and all of these, all of those things as created were reflected in human beings. That's being ruined by the fall, it's being restored by Christ. And then, one more aspect, since God who is Father is also King, it's no surprise at all that as soon as God created them in his image, he also said, and now rule over all creation. Because children of a king are princes and princesses, and they have royal responsibilities. So man was also created to be a prince and 
Eve a princess. Okay, but we must move on because that's the way it was when God created everything. As I said, beautiful, privileged, great responsibility. But now we're talking after the fall and we're talking about how this applies also in a society that's rejected God, rejected the Bible. How do we work that out? There are certainly challenges here that need to be respected. I think you may need to help me out, brother, in the back. Somehow, did I do something wrong? Got stuck. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see if we need to work it from the back. So now we go on to the next topic, unbelievers and the remnant of the image. An important but a challenging question. There we go. We've already seen in Genesis 9, verse 6, that even after the fall, after the flood, God still uses the image that he created as the foundation to prohibit murder. This comes back also in James. There's another prohibition of the tongue. You ought not to speak ill of others because, James says, after all, they were made in God's image. So in some way, the image of God still functions after the fall into sin. But if... Oh, no, really interesting things are starting to happen. Am I doing something wrong? Uh, no? Blame it on the computer. It's always the easiest way, right? If you can... Yes, there. Maybe I'll just leave that thing alone and I'll just raise my hand or something and we can go forward in that way. Our confessions also recognize that there is something that lingers without compromising total depravity. Belgian Confession 14. Since man became wicked and perverse, corrupt in all his ways. This is no watering down of the fall into sin. Corrupt in all his ways. He has lost all his excellent gifts, which he had once received from God. He has nothing left but some small traces. These small traces are not something positive on which you can build all kinds of wonderful things. They leave a man inexcusable. Nevertheless, there are these small traces. In the canons of Dort, this would be described as the light of nature. It's some notions about God, even that among unbelievers, there's some regard for, well, that's a proper, that's a virtuous, that's a decent thing to do. Even within the world of business, there will be some sense that that's a decent way to put together a business deal, and that's kind of underhanded. There's still some sense of that within our society. If we go ahead. Reaching to John Calvin for a little bit of help, he said in a commentary on the psalm that we sang together, on the one hand, the image has been ruined, but it is a ruin of the image of God. And just like you see off in the right-hand side there in the picture, that's a ruin. That's a destruction. What are you going to do with that? However, you can see, if you look closely, it's a ruin of a house. It's a ruin of a dwelling. There's some small traces of what it once used to be. And Calvin says, don't deny this. The reason, to dis uh, the reason, thinking to distinguish good and evil, this idea that there's a higher power and something that we ought to respect, this principle of religion. And you can see other things such as social bonds and respect for social bonds and even a conscience. These are small traces of what it once used to be. If we go forward one. John Calvin then also goes to connect this with the image of God referring to created to be children of God. And here we need to be extremely careful. And yet, in Acts 17, he points out the following. This is what Scripture says. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, referring to God, 
Athens, the Apostle Paul speaking in Athens, as even some of your own prophets have said, and then the Apostle kind of acknowledges there's truth in what those poets say, we are indeed his offspring, God's offspring. And being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold and silver, and therefore he puts forward an argument against idolatry. Calvin said it in this way. With respect to creation, the fact that we're here on this earth and still living, all human beings owe their existence to God. And he begins to connect that a little bit to God as Father, because it's from Father that life comes. All human beings are brought into existence by God, and even though there have all become rebels in the fall, God still knows that he created them to be children, even though they are now rebels, enemies of God. God still knows how they were created to be, and God hasn't forgotten that either. And so important is the way that God created them to be, he still uses it today to say, therefore, no human being should be murdered, young or old. But then, when we speak about the children of God, Calvin says, we don't use that just generally and say everyone in the world is a child of God. No. He says, with respect to salvation, adoption as God's children is clearly restricted to those who believe and promised within the covenant to their children as well. So that's how, also with a little bit of help from Calvin, it gets pulled all together. Next one, please. Here we now apply it to the two tragic but also challenging issues in our society today. Image of God, how can this be an antidote? Advance, thank you. As we've discovered, there are two ways that you can look at the image of God. You could say it's all about what a creature, what human beings are able to do. They're able to think, they're able to choose, they're able to create, speak, care. As we've already discovered, you could say generally that applies, but it doesn't apply consistently across the board for all human beings, and it's exactly where there's a limited ability to think, choose, speak, or care, such as in the womb. There are limitations there. The life has just begun. Or at the end, when people lose their ability to think and choose and maybe even speak and express care, they go into a coma or something else. It's exactly when human beings are at the vulnerable that if you go along these lines, those will be left most vulnerable for someone to come forward and say, well then, maybe there is permission to put these to death. If we, though, think of the image of God as, not in the first place, what can these creatures do, what do they have the capacity to do, but rather ask the relational question, to whom do these creatures belong, then the defense gets stronger because even if they lose the ability to think, they still belong. Even if they're not so good at being creative, they still belong. And it's that idea that we want to now work out more specifically. First of all, for abortion. If you could please advance. Let's take the situation of Down syndrome. Consider the following. If a child with Down syndrome is born to parents, and for the moment we can even speak about parents generally in society, not even within the context of salvation in the church. But in such situation, if after having a child in their own arms, the doctor would come to such a father and mother and say, look, obviously your child has Down syndrome. We can see that. We've done some tests now. I know a lot of this is done today within the room, but let's say it wasn't done, and they made the diagnosis after the child had been born. If at that point the doctor would say to this new mother and father, 
we think it best to put this child to death. You would not be at all surprised, brothers and sisters, if the parents would react and say, what do you want to do with our child? You see, at that point, it's not just that it's a human being, but it's that it's a human being that belongs to that father and that mother. There's a relationship, even if it's just an initial maybe only a few days, weeks old, but there's a relationship, and that makes their reaction all the stronger. What are you saying, doctor? You want to put our child, not just a child, but our child to death? Well, if we can advance from Down syndrome death in human parents, and notice that relationship may definitely come in that consideration how much the more when we have Down syndrome, considering death, and the heavenly creator. The heavenly creator is also father. He is eternally father. That's part of who he is. And everything that he does, even forming and fashioning every human being within the womb, he cannot put to the side that he's father. Even if that child is not part of the covenant, still the God who created that child is a father. He is eternally father. And therefore, when human beings, even upon testing in utero, would say, we've now determined that this child has Down syndrome, quality of life may not be too high in our perception and estimation. Therefore, we should consider aborting this child or they wouldn't call it a child, of course, but if that's what they say, then it's not just that life is something special. It's that that child is related by creation to God. And for God, this is so offensive that this creature, this child that he has formed in fashion, some human being or human beings would say, we want to put your creature, your creature to death. The relationship makes a difference. And I think then when we want to communicate this, because that's the challenging part, to a society that knows nothing about the image of God anymore, or hardly, to a society that's rejected the word of God, that's the hard part. But if we from within the church show that all of these children are cherished, loved, they're brought into the relationship not just of their family but of their church. That's the way that we speak with a strong antidote against what the world is doing and the direction it's going. We show them what relationship to children is all about. Let's go to the next one, antidote for euthanasia. If we think now of another context of the father-children relationship, which is integral to the image of God, the children should honor the father. This is basic. This is the fifth commandment. But that also means that if we are created to be children of God, and now let's bring it for the moment within the church, having that blessing of being recreated in the image of the son, being adopted as God's own children, one of our highest priorities in life will always be honor the Father. Also when it's painful, honor the Father. Also when it's difficult, honor the Father. And when we go through suffering or pain, that in that yet we honor our Heavenly Father. This also reflects what it ought to be given the fact that we were created to be children of God and now in Christ recreated to be children of God. And so we don't just look to the suffering or the lack of mobility or other difficulties of old age. We say, even in those hard circumstances, we can glorify God, and that's what we want to do. There's a possible objection, of course. How is this going to have any impact on unbelievers? They are not recreated in the image of the Son. They don't understand this. They don't think along these lines. 
Well, one of the most powerful things that we can do is not only argue human life is special, it's holy, therefore it should have special treatment. That's good. But in addition, we can also show within the church that through the sufferings, also at the end of life, to cherish the relationship with God, to honor Him, and also cherish relationship within those whom He has placed in our life, family, brothers and sisters in the Lord, what we can show will be as powerful an argument as human life is special, it's sacred. I think I better leave it there because we need some room for questions and I see the time is going on. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Invleet. Uh, we do have uh, time for some questions. Uh, if there are any questions from the floor for uh, our brother. Uh, down here at the front. Uh, uh, Yalta. If I understood you well, uh, particularly at the end there, you said that even if a child is not a believer, he is still a child related to God by creation. Um, how would you then understand the imprecatory psalms and, for example, the fact that at the flood the Lord destroyed all he, all those people that he had created? That's a good question. Yeah. Two aspects um, to that answer. Um, in the first place... Um, we can't climb up into the mind and the heart of God and fully understand and appreciate how that all works within him, you know. What goes on in the mind and, so to speak, the heart of God in having to punish also so severely the creation that he made? Um, we're always going to be limited in our understanding there. I think of the Belgian Confession, Article 13, we ought not to curiously inquire beyond what our capacity allows. So there's, part of the answer is going to have to be, here we, here we reach some of our limits. In addition to that though, um, it actually highlights the totality of the fall and the depravity in this way. If um, human beings in their sinfulness were simply sinning against God the lawgiver, right? That would be already wrong, deep, and sinful, and God as lawgiver has every right to punish in his holiness and righteousness. So we can't say that God did anything wrong in, you know, destroying all these creatures that was within his righteousness and his holiness. But when you now think of the fact that all of these sinful human beings, you know, as human beings, and God, God knows still that he created human beings to be his children. And now they rebel, they make themselves to be enemies of God. This makes it all the more tragic because if one of, um, one of my own children sins against the government, right? I already say, son, daughter, what are you doing? But if I have taught and, and cherished that child and brought him up and say, you don't do that, you don't do that, and yet my own son, my own daughter rebels, it hurts more. And so these human beings that were created with that special privilege are yet rebelling, rebelling, rebellion. It makes the sinfulness of the fall, even that much greater, tragic, offensive. Yeah? But yeah, how that all works in the heart and the mind of God, I think then we're going to go beyond what we can uh, understand and what, beyond what God has revealed.
question? Yes. Um, could you not compare the, um, the abortions to um, the sacrificing of children to Moloch in the Old Testament? Because basically it's um, a similar sort of sin because it's they're sacrificing their children or unborn children to their selfish um, life, so to speak. I suppose there is some comparison. Uh, when they did that, they were doing that because in their twisted, warped understanding, this would be the ultimate sacrifice which would surely please the god Molech and turn his um, blessing and benefit toward the person who made such a horrendous sacrifice. But uh, that's the way they would have thought of it, by making this ultimate sacrifice of giving one of your own children over, surely this god must be convinced to show favor to you. Obviously, people who are going forward with abortion are not thinking along uh, those lines. Um, but, yeah, there may be some selfish motive in it. That's what you're, what you're speaking of. Um, but there is, I think, also a, a fundamental difference because what people are saying today in society is either that's not person, right? It's not person yet, and therefore there's no obstacle to end the life. This is an abortion. Or this is a human being, this is a person, but their life is not worth living according to some subjective relative standards, and therefore we're justified in putting it to end. Uh, the presentation this evening is meant to say that uh, God said in Genesis 9, image of God, that's the reason why not. And therefore, that's what we have to keep center. And the society around us won't get this anymore. They won't. But we can show this and show the implications to them and therefore in that way make the argument against these things in a certain way just by the way we treat, you know, the life in the womb, the way we treat life even when there are difficulties, Down syndrome or other handicaps, and also how we treat life at the end. Thank you, Dr. Van Vliet. Um, my question, a little bit about the image of God. Um, we see God in the Trinity as well. That's a, a big part of who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And obviously, that's also relational. Um, can you just maybe just um, have a talk, let us know a little bit about that and how that, how that affects also our view of the image of God? Well, thank you for this uh, intriguing question. The question being, since we're created in the image of God, God is triune, so is there some type of threeness in us is one of the questions that's been asked. And um, over the years, theologians have given a lot of thoughts to this, and they've said, well, there is one passage, 1 Thessalonians 3, that speaks about the human being, body, soul, and spirit. So then you have three. And maybe that's a reflection of triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, body, soul, and spirit. Um, that's, you're going to run into some very strange thoughts there, right? So you might say, well, spirit and man connected to the spirit of God. Okay. So is the body more connected to the father or the son? The soul, it, things go very strange very quickly. Um, what is revealed, and this puts us on less speculative and more solid ground, is what we read in Colossians chapter um, 1, verse 15, but, and I'll connect it to verse 13 in just a moment. He is the image of the invisible God, speaking not about us, but speaking about Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. And who is that he? In verse 13, he's specifically described as 
his beloved son. So his beloved son, verse 14, 15, he is the image of the invisible God. So there's something, I, I find it wonderful, uh, I find it something that you can't fully comprehend as other things with God. But on the one hand, human beings were created in the image and likeness of God. On the other hand, within the triune Godhead, between the Father and His beloved Son, you can also, scripturally speaking, use the word image. It's right there. So in that relationship between Father and Son, there is the word image, and attached to it likeness, in full divine likeness. And in being recreated, we are not recreated in, in the first place, the image of the Spirit or something. We're recreated in the image of the Son, and so restored as true children of the Father. So it is connected, but I would not go in the direction of saying, well, there's three in one in God, therefore there should somehow be three in one in us. Actually, three in oneness, triuneness, is a distinct divine. The, 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 that, that's in a category all of its own. That doesn't get kind of reflected into us. Uh, we'll take two more questions and then we'll uh, end with the questions because we have to get on to talk about the seminary. So, uh, Brother Wilco and then uh, Brother Eichelblum. Good evening. Just a question. Um, I assume that we all agree with your interpretation about the image of God, the value of that, and also that we have to set an example regarding euthanasia and abortion. Um, but I have a task at the moment to convince members of the Labour Party that euthanasia is wrong. That what euthanasia is wrong. Is wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, but uh, that they can't uh, make that into a law in WA. Um, what arguments can I use to convince an unbeliever that this is definitely wrong? Yes. Um, so, um, there can be arguments that you put forward also coming out of what's traditionally called the, the sanctity of life argument. I'm not at all suggesting that we should jettison that argument. This is an additional uh, argument or antidote. So we can in uh, some way try to show that human life is, is special, sacred, holy. But even there we have, we have a great uphill battle because almost everyone that we're talking to in the world is convinced of the theory of evolution. And then what's special really about human life? It's just on the continuum. And you probably know very full well, brother, that that's the way the argument goes, right? If an animal is suffering, you put the animal down. So if the human being is suffering, why not end the life? That's the logic, right? And so long as the world keeps thinking in its foundational philosophy, on the basis of evolution, we, coming from the point of creation, creation in the image of God, it will always be a very um, hard argument. And that's why part of what I'm trying to say here is that whatever arguments we can put together, at the end of the day, I think one of the most powerful things is how we're going to show, both at the beginning and the end, how life can be respected as a gift from God. My question follows up on that point. Yep. How could we do? How could we do things better? Are we doing things as well as we could? And how even how can we encourage each other to do better on caring for the unborn, for let's say the disabled, and for the elderly? Let's take one example for both. I'll, I'll start with um, the last one about um, the movement towards um, doctor-assisted suicide and, and those. Um, there is, you, you might have seen it, um, I kind of cut it short due to time, but there was a reference to the hospice movement. 
a movement, and this is not always from Christians, sometimes unbelievers, to say there is a way to die and come to the end of this earthly sojourn which can be done without um, doctor-assisted suicide but can be very respectful and can also be um, edifying, helpful. One of the questions I think we should consider is um, how involved could we and should we be in that hospice movement? Um, what could we do as churches to either be part of that or maybe this is a service that uh, we would shape up. We, you know, mentally handicapped brothers and sisters, we know how to do this. And maybe we need to get more into the hospice and then not only for perhaps our own, but also to show others, you know, you, death can be done in a very respectful way. And who knows what opportunities are there also for spreading the gospel when death is right there before us. On the other side, I've seen um, good things. I think of um, ARPA in Canada, and maybe I know there's ARPA Association here, but in this context, they have highlighted in a public and visible way that those who have severe limitations mentally and physically can yet in the context of family and church life have a very rich and blessed life, both ways. The, those who have the limitations and those who support them and surround them. And they've videoed that, they've put that out there. And I know that also for unbelievers, it's been a very powerful testimony. And when they just focus on the limitations and maybe these kind of lives should be ended. And then they see this completely different perspective on it. Um, it's actually very powerful. Thank you, Dr. Van Vliet. Uh, we will switch now from image of God, abortion, euthanasia, over to uh, CRTS and an update and a bit of an introduction to the seminary in Hamilton. Thank you. Brother? We're going to see. You think it's going to work? All right. So, I have the... Um, privilege uh, to teach as the professor of dogmatics, professor of all the different doctrines at CRTS, and for the last two years serve as the principal. And in that capacity, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to show you a little bit about seminary life. First of all, um, by the grace and also by the faithfulness of our God, the seminary has been in existence for 50 years this year, five decades of the Lord's care, also through some very difficult times related to uh, the health of um, professors, not only recently, but also at the very beginning. There were serious health concerns, even death of an appointed professor, but the Lord has granted what was needed. In this connection, we are also this year working on a book, actually finishing it up. Here you see a draft version of the front color, cover, Your Word is Our Light. It will be adjusted slightly yet before it goes into publication. That little golden torch at the top needs some further attention, but that probably has been done already in my absence. Um, this book will go over the five decades of history. It also explains in quite some detail the present operation of the seminary and includes lots of pictures and uh, some interesting anecdotes about men who may uh, serve as uh, your ministers and missionaries. And you will find out that uh, also among seminary students, sometimes very interesting and memorable things happen. As I worked on this book, one of the things that was reconfirmed in my mind with more particular facts, some of them I wasn't aware of because they happened when I was either a little child or earlier than that before I was born, is that Australia has been involved from the very beginning. First convocation, they were there with letter, they were there with uh, an assurance of their prayers, they were there with also a monetary gift, and that, in various different ways, has continued right to this very day. Um, we just had opportunity for a day and a half to sit together as deputies and two from the seminary to work together and to think things through. It's a very, very blessed context in which to work, and we thank you for all of your support here. It does mean a lot to us. 
In this respect, I just highlight that at the seminary, uh, among the core values is, in the first place, serving our supporting churches. Um, we do say that for a reason. That means not only the churches in Canada, but the churches also here in Australia. You are one of our supporting groups of churches, and we thank you for that, and we look to your needs best that we can. Um, in addition to academic excellence, there's also an emphasis on training men who will be effective as pastors and grow in personal godliness as well. That should become a little bit clear shortly. Let's go through a few pictures. Um, walking about uh, one uh, kilometer, a little bit less, down from the seminary, this is the view that you would see over what's called the escarpment. Uh, there is some water in the background there. It's Lake Ontario, Hamilton Harbor. I'll admit, the beach there is not quite as good as the foreshore in Rockingham, but there's some sand. If you walk up to the building, this is what you would see. Sign at the front, the building behind. Off to the right is the library. Off to the left is just the beginning of the professor's offices. And behind is the peak of the chapel. If we go around the back of the building, um, you'll see, first of all, the two-story library building, which contains some 35,000 volumes in its library, print, more in the digital uh, way. Uh, then there is uh, the chapel. I'll explain that in a moment. This building was formerly a Presbyterian church, that was purchased, and then this addition to make it more functional as a seminary. Down below here are the classrooms. Let's take a walk inside. Every Monday morning, first thing, every Friday after the last class has been taught, we come together, we sing, we pray. The Word of God is explained either by a professor um, or a student. We have a what we call a short chapel of about 20 minutes to a half hour together. At present, uh, we have four accompanists, one of them being uh, one of your native sons here, Rodney Denbour, a very accomplished man on both piano and organ, and here he's leading on the piano. We also have uh, an organ that is used for accompaniment. It's off to the right hand side. More importantly, you see here a student giving a chapel message. This happens. Uh, Regularly, as I say, there are far more students than professors, so most of the chapels are given by students. It gives them an opportunity to learn, to expound God's word, and here you see Anson van Delden doing this. I picked the photos which had Australians on them. Another key aspect of this room is every Wednesday, one or two students will deliver a complete sermon which will be carefully analyzed by professor or often two professors. This is called Sermon Session. It's every Wednesday. It's right in the middle of the week. I actually see that as symbolic. All the rest of the classes, everything else that's taught, it all leads up to that which is at the middle, proclaiming God's word. I just want to highlight the Women's Savings Action. All of the monies to support the library, the purchase of books, the purchase of uh, subscriptions to digital uh, repositories of journals or also e-books, it's all funded by um, volunteer effort of the women in the churches in Canada. There have been significant contributions along the way from Australian churches as well. Women's Savings Action are very thankful for that. Um, it's a beautiful way in which the Seminary is connected to the grassroots. It would be easy to put it on the budget, but involving all the congregations annually in raising about $35,000 or so for the library keeps the seminary close, and in that respect, there's something beautiful there. Here's a typical picture. I'll admit, for this photo, they posed because the photographer was there, but this is not at all atypical. If you would walk into the library, either here or at a desk that's uh, off to the side where people can sit around, we often, often see students sitting, studying, talking together from different countries. This is Dathan Plyder. He's from Australia. This is Timothy Veenstra. He's from Hamilton, Canada. This is Tim Van Beek. He's from Manitoba, Canada. 
You'll see a slide in a moment which lists other areas, other countries. Almost everybody at the seminary, eight out of 10, sometimes it's almost nine out of 10, have moved in to come to seminary. It's not just the Australians. Um, there's others coming from other countries. And within Canada, most every student has to move house, either from another province or from an area in Ontario to get closer to the seminary. So it brings a strong bond because everybody has uprooted to one degree or the other to come together to prepare for the ministry. Here's the year one or freshman classroom. When they come, all the students are in the same classroom for their first year. And uh, this is what that looks like. Here once again you see, um, this is a couple of years ago, but here's an Australia, Aidan Plug, studying next to a man from Korea, Daniel Shin. When I give you the list in a moment, you'll see that this is also part. There are those who are very attracted to the Reformed heritage, to everything that we've been given by the grace of God, and one way or the other, they make their way to CRTS. Once finished in the freshman classroom, all the rest of the years learn together, year two, three, and four. So it's obviously, it's a bigger, it's a fuller classroom. Um, this is as it was a couple of years ago. It's a little bit, uh, we have some other students now, obviously. Here are some of the students right now. And you can see probably from the back, even that here they're having a good chuckle. This is Mark Ten Half, recently called by Armadale for mission work, plus a couple of other congregations. But uh, he's laughing heartily. This is also common. We, we study hard, we work hard, but we also have some really heartfelt laughs together, which makes for a beautiful sense of community. Here's the entire group, students, professors, and the staff after the exams were done at Christmas. Um, everyone's quite jubilant, obviously. They've done their exams. They're looking forward to a meal together, which is our tradition after, every, after the exam period is done. Everybody brings some food. We have some ethnic food too. I've eaten um, beets on hamburgers, which apparently is part of an Aussie burger, you know, all these kinds of things. They come into that meal. I've eaten kimchi from the Korean students. It just makes for a very wonderful end. Uh, these men have not received their marks back yet, so they might have the hand a little bit lower after the marks come back. A few statistics that give a bit of perspective on the Lord's grace toward the seminary and to us all through it. Since the year 2000, uh, 57 students have graduated from the Master of Divinity program. If you do the quick math, that means an average of three students graduate, graduating per year. That's not really enough to sustain the need of our federations, mission work. Um, we would need more graduates than that to be sure. Thankfully, the Lord is um, cultivating things in a good direction. Currently, we have uh, 24 students divided over four years. That's an average of six students per year. So the student body is on an upward trend for which we are very thankful. At the same time, as you'll see um, below here, um, one of those students is from Poland, one from the United States, uh, from American Reformed Church, part of the Canadian Reformed Federation, three from Korea, one from the Philippines, two from China, six from Australia, and 10 from various provinces in Canada. And you see the breakdown by province. So there's 24 there, and the numbers are increasing, but as you can well imagine, the man from Poland and the Philippines and Korea and China will, under the Lord's blessing, most likely, most of them, go back to their own countries and do, under the Lord's blessing, great work for the kingdom there, but that still leaves us as Canadian churches and Australian churches needing um, more students to come. And therefore, we're very thankful for the Timothy Conference done here and a similar parallel conference done in Canada in January, which has received great response from young men interested in studying for the ministry. And we pray that that will be blessed and actually materialize 
in more ministers over the years. 10.30, coffee time. Students, professors, staff, everyone sits together. If it's your birthday, we sing. If it's your birthday, donuts are required, preferably from Tim Hortons. If you've been to Canada, you understand that joke. Ah, we have a table tennis, ping pong. Once in a while, the guys will uh, go and play. If there's a Korean on one side of the table, he wins. Simple. <laughs> Professors, Dr. John Smith, teaching Old Testament. Dr. G.H. Fisher, teaching New for one more academic year. And Dr. William Den Hollander has been appointed by the most recent Synod in Canada to replace him in about a year's time. Dr. Ted, or Theodore Van Ralty, teaches church history and also church order, church polity. Dr. Aryan de Visser, preaching, mission work, uh, pastoral care, including um, catechism teaching. And as mentioned before, I teach dogmatics, uh, going through all the different doctrines of scripture one by one. Just to highlight, uh, there is, of course, classroom instruction at the seminary. That's the core that's been there for many, many years. Over the last 20 years, practicum, internship, having the students be involved in congregations, involved in mission work. You have uh, now um, student Kelvin Decker coming back to Australia, serving in the Albany area as part of his pastoral training program. Um, you've had other men coming through also in the mission work that Australia is involved in. What may not be quite so widely known is that we've also had a concerted effort, I would say, over the last seven to eight years of shaping up careful, purposeful uh, relationship with these men. All the students get divided among the professors. They make mentor groups. We sit with these men, we visit with them, we listen to their challenges. When they have struggles, when they are battling whatever kind of disappointment or, or temptation, we pray with them. And under the Lord's blessing, um, it's the goal that they grow in godliness and spiritual strength because they will need a lot of that when they enter the ministry. So this is a what we call spiritual formation program. Still needs more refinement but it's come a long ways in the last eight years. Three ladies. Where would the seminary be without the efforts of these ladies? I don't really want to think about that for too long because they are a very important part. Margaret Alkema, our librarian. Catherine McKelsey, many years of service as office assistant, administrator. Leanne Kazinga, more specialized work on the computer, um, also with respect to... Um, some government regulations that we have to meet to operate a school in Canada. September, graduation and the start of a new year, convocation. If you are ever in Canada in September, please, brothers and sisters, feel free to come to the convocation. It really is a special evening. One last thing. We have a website, but as part of that website, um, in the news section, we have various ways in which you can keep up to date uh, on what's happening at the seminary between the times that professors uh, are privileged to come here. We do have a Facebook page, more informal pictures. Sometimes there are special events or something kind of humorous happens at the seminary. The more informal things we put on Facebook. And then there are more substantial and I would say more significant updates given by email prayer requests for the seminary with particular events or significant developments. So with those two, you can stay up to date and um, stay connected to the seminary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Van Vliet. Uh, we'll take a question or two or three, if there are any. Any uh, Theological zingers that you want to ask our uh, professor of dogmatics? No. Anything relating to seminary life? Please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it seems like the uh, <coughs> the current number, the current group of 
of uh, lecturers are quite quite a bit younger than they were, um, say, 20 years ago. Um, with all the time that they would be spending in in the seminary, would <coughs> and also considering that there's a, quite a long time that they would be working as professors, would there be any interest in going outside the seminary, or is there scope for to go outside the seminary and work as ministers for several years during that time frame? So let me see if I understand. Take a sabbatical from being a professor in order to be a minister for a while again. Um, well, it's, uh, I can say of, of all the presentations that I've done over the years, uh, brother, both in Canada and Australia, no one has ever asked me this question before. So it may not be a theological zinger, but it is a first. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, in the first place, um, the professors, um, each is in their own family situation and so on, but they are regularly preaching in the congregations, obviously most of all locally, but also if they travel um, in uh, other provinces or here in Australia, I think Sunday afternoon, here. Um, so we don't stop preaching, and it has to be balanced. You can only do so much, but I can tell you that every, every professor there has a love and a passion for preaching, and we continue to do that. So I'm not sure we have to step out of being a professor in order to keep preaching. There's plenty of opportunity to do that. Um, the other side of it is this, though. Um, if, for instance, um, I would take a three-year break and go and serve in some congregation. Um, in order to, we all know that when a teacher starts in a primary or secondary school, the first year, I mean, they're going to be swamped, right? At the seminary, it's a three-year cycle because there's years two, three, and four together. So, you, first of all, you have to prepare for two grades, if I can use that. You've got to prepare for the freshman classroom, then you've got to prepare for the senior classroom. And for three years, you're doing first years. And you're swamped. So um, to, to bring a man in to replace the professor and have him ramp up for three years, he's going to be working and working and working and then say, okay, thanks, now we're going to... No, I don't think that would go over so well. So there are practicalities. Neat idea, but I don't think it's going to work so well. Thanks for the question. Uh, any other uh, questions in regards to the seminary? Good evening. My question is more regarding the women or the wives or the girlfriends that mm. are going to be involved in their husband's work, and is there any special training or any work that you do with them in preparing them for their task? Very good question, and thank you for that. Um, so first of all, um, already for quite some time, uh, the girlfriends, uh, wives of seminary students have um, come together. They have, in addition to Bible study within their local congregation. They also, as a seminary group of women, they have a Bible study together. And they have invited twice a year, yeah, twice a year, um, they invite the professor's wives to be involved as well. And then that's quite an interesting evening where um, the professor's wives are peppered for quite some time with all kinds of questions uh, from the seminary wives. Uh, so that's been going on for some time. But in January, for the first time ever, we had, uh, in, in between our two main semesters, we have a two-week what we call J-term. It's a short semester. We focus on some special things that we don't get done in the regular coursework in the other two main semesters. And now we've added a seminary wives' day as part of that small interim semester. It's very well received. And we've started to work out kind of a four-year program as to different topics that we should go through. And um, I look forward to seeing that develop. So the short answer to your question is, 
In the past, we, there has been something, but we haven't done as much as I think we ought to have, but we're getting on to that. I think it's a good development. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And I'm in a no position of uh, representing our churches, but I want to uh, say my sincere apology in inviting you in June. We never quite could weather during the 11 month. I was not sure why you have to come to June, but yeah. The, my real question is, uh, uh, so at the moment, what are the biggest or what are the main challenges the seminary is uh, facing and uh, so what, what can also we pray about it? Uh, so I wonder what would be in the now when you see the earlier you mentioned about health of the previous professors. So I wonder now what kind of uh, present challenges you have and what would be a specific prayer point we can have when we think of the seminary. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. A um, few things come to mind. Um, in the first place, please pray in general for the, the ongoing, yeah, well-functioning, health and healthy functioning of the seminary. Um, we live in a world that is increasingly hostile to the church. And uh, we, for the most part, to this point in time, uh, see that happening particularly in other areas of the world. But in Canada, and I also learned upon coming here, also in Australia, we see um, that the influence of the world, the decisions of government or the platforms of political parties threaten to restrict what we can do. And we've mostly been talking about it and sensing it at the level of um, our primary and our secondary schools and what will happen there. To this point, the, um, the governments really, they have nothing to do with seminaries. You know, Let seminaries do what they want to do. But let's pray that that continues to be that free and let's not take for granted that it just will continue. So I know that's kind of a long-term prayer point, but I think it's a very significant one. Um, secondly, prayer for um, new um, or, or men who are willing to be uh, and train towards having the proper academic uh, credentials for being professors. This has been highlighted in Una Sancta, um, one issue, and I hear there's another one coming out uh, this Sunday perhaps, or next Sunday, whenever it's coming out. Um, this is a need for the seminary um, to have a, a pool of men who have the proper degrees and who have these degrees in a variety of different departments areas so that there will be those who can replace in due time. They're a little bit younger than they may have been, but younger becomes older. That does happen. Um, apparently, as my children remind me, it's also happening to me. So. Um, the last thing I think specifically was mentioned, the seminary wives. Um, the demographics of seminary have been changing a little bit. Uh, when I went, there were a lot of single young men and uh, there was that married man and maybe even he had uh, two, three children. Um, but it was a little bit on the, on the rare side, mostly of single young men. That's pretty well changed now and a lot of the men are married or about to be married and when we have that potluck uh, dinner together after exams the seminary gets overrun by little people and it's a beautiful thing i mean they they, they rip around we keep them out of the library we put a big padlock on the library no we don't but um, uh, it's a beautiful thing but it's also a challenging thing for these men and they have to learn how to balance family life and uh, studies they'll need that in the ministry so it's a good head start, but those are three things that come to mind. I thought I saw another hand, maybe uh, a final question. Uh, 
Rob. Dr. Van Fleet, thank you very much for the information you've given us this evening. Um, I, I have a question about uh, whether the seminary promotes itself uh, in the sense of there's been an increasing number of students um, from other countries also studying, I think, in the seminary over the last 10 or so years. Um, the churches in Canada have contact with a number of, or an increasing number of churches in North America as well. There are various seminaries in North America which have been used by other churches. Um, are there more, uh, uh, is there a greater diversity of, of men from different churches that wish to attend uh, Hamilton? And does the seminary, in a sense, promote itself in some way, or is it more by contacts that it has with individuals? Mostly the latter, um, by contacts that are there or these men in one way or the other in the Lord's providence coming in our direction. Um, as you saw there in the, in the core values, um, we, right from the start, are um, a federational seminary. Um, most seminaries in the world, most seminaries in North America to be sure, are not. They're in, you know, it sounds kind of strange, but they're in an educational marketplace and they're trying to get market share of the people who want to study and therefore they, yeah, they can put a lot of time and a lot of energy and, and a lot of finances into promotion and marketing and, and all of that. Um, uh, we don't go strong into that, you know, we don't invest all kinds of time and all kinds of the money that's generously given from the churches. Um, I think that needs to be said in the first place. Those whom the Lord brings in his providence, we, we want to share, we, we welcome them, all things being in order. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to, um, yeah, not be out there a little bit because the Lord has given us something very, very precious to treasure and to share. So. Um, it was one of the things we did a complete revamp of the website. Uh, the old website it worked, but in this day and age, you should have a decent website where people can go and they can find things and it all kind of works nice and even looks uh, somewhat good. We saw that also as part of another core value, spreading the Reformed heritage far and wide. Well, then in this day and age, you need a decent website. Um, there are other things that we do but we don't want to lose the focus on being a federational seminary and um, we don't want to start getting into this kind of competitive thing with other seminaries and no, that's, I don't think that's where the Lord's called us to be and in the meantime, he gives us plenty of opportunity to work and may give us more in the future, we'll see. Thank you, Dr. Invleet, for... Uh taking those questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for coming here uh, this evening and, and telling us about the, the image of God and its relevance for the culture that we live in. Thank you too for informing us about the seminary. Uh, let's first thank uh, Dr. Van Bleet with a round of applause. And we do uh, thank you for uh, representing the seminary here in our midst. Uh, we really value the work that is done at CRTS. We, we enjoy the benefits of it, the fruits of uh, the, the work that has been done and is being done at CRTS. And as a bond of churches, we really highly value the, the leadership and the, uh, the wisdom that is shown uh, through the professors in, in writing and uh, first and foremost in teaching uh, our young men. So thank you, and, and we will continue to pray for the work of the seminary, uh, for the teachers, for uh, your families, for the students and the staff, uh, that God will continue to bless you with faithfulness and strength and wisdom for the future. May the Lord uh, give his blessing. I'd like to, uh, to end with uh, singing a song, and then we'll pray after that, uh, let's sing uh, hymn 78, 
verse 1, 4, and 5, thanking God for all that God provides for us so richly. Let us call on God's name in a prayer of thanksgiving. O Lord, our God in heaven, we praise you as almighty creator and gracious savior, you who has made us and who has provided us with everything that we need for life, that we may praise you For, O Lord, that is what you desire from us. As your people in Christ, you desire our praise, our worship, and adoration. For you, Lord God, are worthy, worthy to receive all thanksgiving and honor and praise now and forever. Father, we thank you for the multitude of blessings that you give us, that you give to us as your sons and daughters, as princes and princesses under you, our great king. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for this evening, Father, when we can reflect on the biblical teaching about the image of God. Father, we can be amazed at how you made us in the beginning, how you showed grace to us when we rebelled, how you are restoring us in the image of Christ, your son, and how you also have a beautiful future in store for us when we may be in your presence and may see you face to face. Father, the message that you give to us in your word is foolishness to this world. It has been forgotten and discarded by so many. And Father, we see the consequences of that in this land and in so many countries around the world where there is a culture of death, where there is a devaluing of the gift of life. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be people who cherish life, who promote life, who show that life is your gift in how we treat the very young and how we treat the weak and the suffering and those who are old. Father, grant that we would be a people who promote the gift of life and who show it in all that we do. Father, we pray too that you would give us courage to speak wisely in a world that rejects your wisdom. Grant us courage 
and boldness in this, we pray. O oh Lord, we thank you this evening as well for the blessing of the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. Father, we praise you for 50 years of faithfulness. We thank you that you have provided for this school for so long and you have allowed it to be a blessing to the churches here and the churches in Canada and in other countries around this world. We thank you, Lord, for providing men who are able to teach. We thank you for sending students who are ready to learn. And Father, in this Thanksgiving, we also ask for your continued blessing. We pray that you would bless the professors who do the work from day to day and from month to month. Give them much energy and strength for this work. Lord, give them also a spirit of humility and dependence on you. Lord, keep them healthy and strong. Bless them also in the midst of their families that they may care for them and lead them faithfully and wisely. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in particular you would be with Dr. Van Vliet and his wife Janet as they enjoy a couple of more days here in Australia and then as they prepare to journey home to Canada. We thank you, Father, for bringing them here, for the blessings that they could experience in being among us. We pray that you would uphold and guard them as they look forward to returning to their family and to their congregation. Heavenly Father, we pray too for a blessing on the students. We thank you that you continue to raise up men for attending seminary and for making themselves available for work in the churches. Lord, we pray that you would continue to work your spirit in the hearts of young men, that they may desire the beautiful task of gospel ministry in your churches and on the mission field. Lord, we pray that you would raise up harvesters for the harvest. We ask too, Father, that you would continue to bless the seminary with the freedom and the opportunity that it continues to enjoy, that there would be no undue opposition from the government or other bodies. We pray that you would continue to allow the work to go on in peace and in freedom and under your blessing. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless us as churches too, as we sit under the preaching of your word, that our hearts would be open, that our minds would be receptive to the beautiful truths that you have given to us in the scriptures and in the gospel of Jesus, your son. Father, may we be a people of your word who live in your word and who love it. Gracious God, we thank you again for the time that you have given us. We thank you for the opportunity for the fellowship that we can enjoy. Be with us now, Father, as we depart from here. Keep us safe and keep us close to you through the power of your spirit and for the sake of Jesus, your son. Amen.